Welcome to Perspectives. I'm Reed Cornwell, your host. My guest is philosopher, jurist, and one-time stand-up comic, Dr. Peter Suber. Most notably, Suber is widely viewed as the de facto leader of the Open Access, or OA, movement. Among his many roles, Suber is a senior researcher at the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, or SPARC, the Open Access Project Director for the Public Interest Advocacy Group Public Knowledge, as well as Research Professor of Philosophy at Earlham College. Suber is also an advisor to a number of other OA-related organizations, including the Wikimedia Foundation. On February 14, 2008, Harvard University announced a plan to publish the university's peer-reviewed scholarly output in an open access repository. Similar policy shifts in institutions and funding agencies around the world are changing the landscape of scholarly publication. My guest, Peter Suber, has been at the forefront of this movement. In the September-October 2002 issue of Technology Source, James Morrison, Innovate's editor-in-chief, interviewed Peter Suber. This interview was titled, the Free Online Scholarship Movement. This edition of Perspectives revisits this interview and explores what has happened since. Peter, it's now five years since your conversation with Jim Morrison. How has your interest in free online scholarship changed? Well, first of all, I've been working full-time on this for five years, so my interest has deepened. I've, it's become an expertise like my areas of teaching strength have been for the past two decades. It's something that I've worked on around the clock the way I've worked on no other topic. So it's my knowledge of open access issues has become broader and deeper. But at the same time, I've been working to change open access policies at universities, publishers, learned societies, and funding agencies. And that work has been succeeding so that the landscape has been changing at the same time that I've been studying it. And my interest has, it's not just that of a, an outsider or a spectator, I've been involved in these changes and it's, it's amazing what a little world changing can do to make a topic more interesting. Well, can you share with us some of the uh, positive change you've seen? Oh, sure. The number of open access journals has multiplied uh, many fold. I don't have numbers going back to compare the baseline of five years ago with today, but there's been a huge growth in the number of open access journals. There's been a huge growth in the number of open access repositories at universities. There's been a very significant growth in the number of open access policies at funding agencies and universities to encourage and sometimes require university faculty and grantees of these funding agencies to make their work open access. And there's been steady growth, I wouldn't say huge growth, but steady growth in awareness of open access among working researchers. So in your experience, this form of communication is succeeding, supplanting, and supplementing existing forms. Is that correct? Yes, I'd say it's a definite success. Five years ago, it was a fairly new idea. It wasn't brand new at all, but it was just entering the consciousness of working faculty, working researchers. But now, it's generally known to most researchers, virtually all journals and publishers and funding agencies and libraries. And although we're not the default method of, the, of uh, research publication, we, there's so much momentum for open access that if people like me disappeared and stopped working, the open access movement would continue unabated. Enough fires have been lit around the world that they would keep going, even if they weren't attended by people like me. Well, of course, Innovate uh, is one of those successes, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's an open access journal, and it's a very good one. Open access is dependent on powerful indexing tools. One such tool is Google Scholar. What has been the impact? It had a lot of promise at the beginning, but it's one of the only Google tools whose usage went down last year. 
I think a lot of scholars were excited about it at first, and for some reason they are less interested today. I'm not sure why. It's still in beta. I, there's a lot of room for it to improve and expand. It has been indexing the open access repositories that configure themselves to support the Google crawler, and I've been supporting that. I've been encouraging repository managers to cooperate with the Google crawler. And the more open access literature is in there, the more visible it is, even though it's already visible to people who know how to find it. So I think it could be one of many tools to help make open access literature visible. But it's by no means the only tool. Plain vanilla Google is actually more widely used for research purposes than Google Scholar. And I love both of them. I love Google Vanilla. I love Google Scholar. But there are other tools that can do the same job. So open access doesn't depend on Google Scholar. And there are rivals to Google Scholar now from Microsoft and uh, previously from Elsevier. And I think open access and research generally benefit from having many tools indexing the same material and competing to deliver better service to researchers. I'm perceiving that you embrace the competition between the uh, search engine providers to improve the availability of this kind of indexed information. I do. Uh, I think the model I like is to provide open access to the basic text and then have service providers compete to add more value to it or to provide more utility to researchers who are trying to uh, discover relevant research, retrieve relevant research, build on, process, and crunch relevant research. Once Do the literature is open access, you can write tools for making it more useful. And I think we have everything to gain and nothing to lose by opening up competition to develop better and better tools for doing that. Peter, are there open access journals included in the Thompson list? If you mean uh, journals whose impact factors are tracked by Thompson. Yes. Uh, in fact, Thompson has included open access journals in its list for uh, impact factor analysis for more than two years, more than three years. And it's even done studies on the relative impacts of open access journals versus uh, total access journals. And ever since it started to do those studies, it has found open access journals to be competitive. As a matter of fact, there is an open access journal within the top cohort of impact factors in every scientific discipline, according to Thompson, going back uh, to the time two or three years ago when they started to track these things. Are wikis, like Wikipedia, viable in this genre? Yes. First of all, wikis deliver open access. But on the other hand, they don't deliver traditionally peer-reviewed open access. They deliver, some, uh, they deliver open access with a different kind of quality control. And that alternate form of quality control is useful for its own purposes, not the same purposes as traditional peer-reviewed literature. And what we're finding as, the, as we move research into the digital age is that sometimes it's valuable to share new ideas with no review at all, for example, on blogs and discussion forums. Sometimes it's valuable to share them with this alternate form of community control, quality control through discussion and crowdsourcing, the way uh, wikis do it. And it's valuable at other times to share research through more formal types of peer review. So we have choices now, and we can communicate at many different levels with many different forms of quality control. And wikis represent one. And they're not just open on the reader side, the way all open access literature is. They're also open on the author side in a way that most peer-reviewed literature is not. And that has both strengths and weaknesses. Are scholars embracing online publication as an appropriate venue? First, we should distinguish open access online publication from subscription-based online publication. And if online publication is taken generically to include both, then the answer is absolutely yes, because all research publication is moving online. Today, about 90% of subscription-based peer-reviewed journals have online editions. And a growing number of those are dropping their print editions, so they're becoming online only. So even if you were, a, let's say, a print snob and you thought important scholarship had to appear in print, the world is changing under your feet, and pretty soon you'll have to publish online uh, whether you like it or not. But most online journals are still subscription-based, not open access. If the question is, are scholars embracing open access literature, the answer is yes. They're, the trajectory is definitely up, but it's not moving up fast. The biggest obstacle we face is educating scholars about the existence and the benefits of open access. There have been a lot of studies of scholar attitudes toward open access, and they detect virtually no opposition 
but they detect a very large amount of ignorance and misunderstanding. So most scholars are not paying attention. And I think that's fairly natural. Scholars are good at what they do because they focus single-mindedly on their research topics, and they tend to ignore just about everything else. In fact, they tend to resist everything else as a distraction from their research. And university administrators know this very well when they try to interest faculty in something like a new fundraising campaign or new parking regulations. The faculty just tune out and get back to their research. The news about open access sounds to them like some development either in technology or in scholarly publishing, and both of those seem boring and irrelevant to their work, and so they get back to their research. This ignorance and misunderstanding about open access has been holding us back, but despite widespread ignorance and misunderstanding about open access, the trajectory is still up, and all the surveys done of scholar attitudes show that the familiarity with open access is on the increase, and the use of open access journals and open access repositories is also on the increase. Do you think that universities should take a more proactive approach to educating their scholars on its value? Yes. They should not only educate their scholars about it, but they should also require that the research output of the institution be made open access and should be put on deposit in the university's institutional repository. All universities should have an open access repository, and they should require that copies of peer-reviewed journal articles published by their faculty be on deposit. Benefit the authors, it would benefit uh, the uh, institution. Congress has been bogged down on a law that would require federally funded research to be published in an open access form or venue. Why has this been bogged down? It's not bogged down. It was just passed in December. And it has been a long three-year struggle, but we finally succeeded in December. The, uh, the first uh, bill in 2004 asked the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, to require open access to NIH-funded research. The NIH didn't comply. That is, it didn't require open access to its research, but it did encourage and request open access to its research. And it was lobbied hard by publishers who hated the idea of an open access requirement for this very large body of very high quality research. And so they got the uh, policy watered down. And the NIH request for open access was without sanction. That is, if NIH grantees did not comply with it, there was no uh, punishment at all. And the NIH made that very clear as a way of deferring to the publisher publishing lobby. But as a result, the compliance rate with the NIH request was dismally low. And after two years, it was still below 4%. And every year since 2004, uh, in 2005, when the policy went into effect, open access advocates like me and many others have been urging Congress to strengthen the NIH policy and to recognize that the weak policy that the NIH instituted is not meeting the original objectives that Congress had in mind. And each of those years, we succeeded to some degree. We got the House Appropriations Committee to support us. Sometimes we got the Senate Appropriations Committee to support us. Twice we got the full House of Representatives to support us. But there was always some snag, and we didn't get full congressional backing for the strengthening of the policy until this year. But even this year, it was a drama. First, the House passed a new bill telling the NIH, your voluntary policy is not working. It has to be a mandate. There has to be mandatory open access for NIH-funded research. The Senate adopted the same language. And this provision was put into a large appropriations bill, which George Bush vetoed on the ground that it spent too much money. In other words, it was unrelated to the NIH or the open access provision. And Congress failed to override the veto. So Congress had to amend the bill, revise the bill to meet the president's expectations and to reduce the spending to a level that he could accept. And after they did it, the NIH provision remained intact. Bush signed the bill the day after Christmas, and now it's law. NIH must require open access to the author's manuscripts, the author's peer-reviewed manuscripts based on NIH-funded research. And just a couple days ago, on January 11th, the NIH released the text of its policy in response to this new congressional directive. 
and it's a very good, very strong policy. This is huge. This is very significant. Uh, the NIH is the world's largest funder of non-classified research. Its research budget for the new fiscal year is $29.2 billion. That's more than the gross domestic product of 142 countries. It results in over 80,000 peer-reviewed journal articles per year, which is more than 200 per day. It's an enormous jump for open access. Now, the policy is in place, and it is a strong one, but it will take some time for it to have an effect. It applies to new grants given on or after April 7, 2008. And after those grants are given, the researchers will still have to do their research. Then they'll have to write it up. Then they'll have to shop it around. Then they'll have to get it published. Then they'll have to submit copies to the NIH. Then they'll have to wait up to 12 months before it's released in some open access form by the NIH. And then, finally, we'll see open access to this large body of research. But for the first time, the wheels are turning, and this will actually happen. Will this be reports from existing research put in repository without review? No. These will be uh, peer-reviewed articles, articles that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. But the NIH is not requiring open access to the published edition of the article. That's a concession to publishers. It's only requiring open access to the author's peer-reviewed manuscript. So if the author's manuscript is accepted by the journal's peer review process uh, and then subsequently copy edited, the peer reviewed version is the one that the NIH will make openly available and the copy edited peer reviewed version will remain the exclusive property of the publisher. And the idea here is to uh, give libraries a continuing incentive to subscribe so that the NIH program won't harm journals. Is there any anticipation that this will be a widespread mandate across funding agencies and different disciplines? Yes, uh, in two senses. First, the, there are already uh, 20, uh, not kind of the NIH, there are already 20 mandates from funding agencies around the world. If the NIH had done what Congress asked back in 2004, it would have been the first but now it's the 21st. And these other funding agencies that require open access represent a wide variety of disciplines. Some of them are focused on one discipline the way NIH is focused on biomedicine, but some of them are general and focus on essentially all the disciplines. So we are seeing funder mandates for open access to research literature across the disciplines. And the second sense is that now that the Congress and uh, the President have approved an open access, strong open access policy for the NIH, I'm quite sure that other federal funding agencies in our country will also mandate open access for their research. Some of them have just been waiting for a green light from Congress, and they will interpret this as the green light they've been waiting for. What uh, economic effect has this had on the publishing industry, either positively or negatively? So far, none, and it's too early to say. Publishers fear that it will destroy them, that it will cause libraries to cancel subscriptions. And if subscriptions are canceled in big numbers, then they're destroyed. We don't know that that will happen. There is some evidence that it will not happen. For example, the only discipline so far in which there's a high level of open access archiving, that is, uh, open access dissemination of articles outside journals, is physics. And in physics, the open access archiving rate approaches 100%, and physics journals are unable to identify any cancellations that can be attributed to open access. So it looks like even high levels of open access archiving are compatible with the continuing survival and prosperity of subscription journals. That's interesting. That has to be explained, but the evidence is that it's happening. That may happen in other disciplines, for example, in biomedicine. So the NIH policy would have no effect on journals at all. On the other hand, biomedicine may turn out to be different from physics in just these respects, and this may end up harming journals. We still don't know. But the NIH policy has two provisions to help journals. One is that it doesn't apply to the published edition of the article. It only applies to the author's peer-reviewed manuscript. And the other is that it allows up to 12 months delay after publication before the NIH copy is made openly available. 
it seems to me that this is parallel to the arguments that the movies and the record industries have had about advances in technology, recording technology. It is parallel, uh, and there are a couple differences. One is that we're talking about publicly funded research, and on the other side, we're not talking about publicly funded music or movies. So there's a very good reason to make this publicly funded research openly available, even if it does harm journals. It serves the public interest, and it's part of fairness to taxpayers. It's part of increasing the return on investment uh, that taxpayers make in research. Uh, the other big difference is that research authors, scholarly authors, are not paid for their journal articles. So when their articles are made open access, they don't lose revenue. On the contrary, they gain impact, which is the reason they wrote the article in the first place. But musicians and movie makers do earn royalties from their work. And to provide open access against their will to those works uh, could deprive them of revenue. But because authors, scholarly authors, are paid salaries by their institutions rather than royalties by their publishers, that controversy just doesn't carry over to published scholarship. A very bright person named Peter Suber said, the day is not far off when most scholars, authors, and readers will expect open access. Are we realizing that expectation? I do think the trajectory is up for the same reason that familiarity with open access is up. As people become aware of it, they also start to expect it. And the generation that grew up with the internet certainly expects it. They can't always be among the leaders in providing it because they're not tenured yet and they feel they need to publish in more conventional places in order to get tenure. But they are completely convinced that it's the way to facilitate and accelerate research. And so they expect open access. And when they look for an article that they need for their research and they come up against a pay-per-view screen at a journal, they instinctively turn to Google and see if they can find the same article free online someplace else. And by the way, very often they can. Whether the publisher permitted it or not, whether it was required by the funding agency or not, more and more authors are just doing that. They're putting their articles up in some free form online after they've been published somewhere. And the rising generation of scholars look for those. As a matter of fact, a recent study showed that they look for free copies of uh, unfree articles before they try interlibrary loan. So I think that's a sign that there is a rising expectation that research literature will be open access somewhere. And there's certainly a rising expectation that it ought to be. As this increasing amount of information and data flood into the marketplace, are the tools, the software tools, keeping up with the demand for better and better abilities? Yes. It's hard to know at what level the software tools ought to be today. But when the literature is freely available, then people are free to come along and provide any kind of useful service or tool that they want. And we are seeing that happen. Search engines are getting better and better. There are better and better alerting services to tell you when new things appear on the topics of interest. There are better and better, uh, call them intelligent tools for processing research literature. There are better and better uh, text mining tools, for example, and data mining tools. There are artificially intelligent programs that will summarize entire articles and reduce them to a paragraph or two. And their accuracy is pretty good. As a matter of fact, their accuracy is so good, they're used on some online news sites. And you can read a one paragraph summary of a news story, which was generated by a software program. And there are more and more programs now, more and more tools for linking together disparate databases using disparate data structures, something that would have been very hard to think of doing uh, 10 years ago. So the general intuition is confirmed that if you put content online in a digital form, people will come along after the fact and cleverly find ways to link it together, uh, to make it more visible, to make it more discoverable, uh, and, and generally to make it more useful. And we are seeing that. I also think we're seeing an acceleration of this. That is, the more of these tools we see, the more it occurs to people that 
free online scholarship is free online data for input to sophisticated software. And it gives them the idea that if we wrote a better tool, we could uh, offer a valuable service. And some of these services are free because the authors of the tools are writing open source, free and open source software. But sometimes these tools are not free because it takes a significant investment to uh, produce them. But whether they're free or unfree, they provide new value for researchers. And they can only do that because the underlying data that they are crunching is freely available uh, as an incentive for entrepreneurs to get busy. Well, Peter, I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball now mm -hmm. and tell me what you see as the future for online scholarship. Well, I foresee that most peer-reviewed journal literature will be open access. And this is this unique body of literature for which the authors are not paid money. And it's the low-hanging fruit for open access. I do think we can have open access to royalty-paying books, but obviously it's harder because the authors fear that they will lose their royalties in the same way that musicians fear that uh, file swapping will deprive them of income. Now, there's some evidence that musicians uh, can gain money, uh, can gain income uh, by letting users sample their works for free. And there's the same evidence that free online royalty-producing books can increase net sales. But that's still higher-hanging fruit. The low-hanging fruit is the journal literature for which authors are not paid, and I expect we'll see 100% open access to that over time. I do not think that 100% open access will exclude subscription access or total access to some percentage of that. That is, there will be dual editions of some of that literature, and one edition will be free, another edition will be unfree. We already see this for some journals, and we see it for some books. Uh, more and more university presses are publishing books in dual editions. A print edition, which costs money, and an online edition, which is free. And not only do they coexist, but as I mentioned, the free online edition tends to increase the net sales of the print edition. So I think we'll see more and more uh, open access to the journal side, uh, slightly more uh, for books, and we'll see more and more publishers accommodating rather than resisting the rise of open access. First, they'll have little choice as more and more funding agencies and authors and universities uh, start to uh, provide open access. They all have to accommodate that world. They just lost the battle at NIH. They all have to accommodate that. They can't accommodate that by refusing to publish work by NIH-funded authors. There are just too many of them, and they're too good. So they will start to adapt. And right now, they are at the, uh, call it the dinosaur moment, in which they fear for their own extinction. But when they realize that there are business opportunities in open access, uh, the adaptation will go a little bit more quickly. We're already seeing some traditional, conventional, subscription-based publishers experimenting with uh, encouraging seriousness with open access and getting uh, some fairly promising results. So it's not going to be as bad as they thought. The sky will not fall. And as that becomes apparent, the number of experiments and adaptive strategies uh, will increase. So open access will increase. Publisher resistance will decrease. Scholarly familiarity will increase. And the policies at the important institutions like universities, libraries, funding agencies, and governments, uh, and learned societies will favor open access as well. What are the challenges ahead for open access and Peter Suber? Well, roughly speaking, more of the same. We just won this big battle at the NIH, and it's a big score because it's such a large funding agency. And it really will make a difference for other funding agencies. But that's what we have to follow through on. Since scholars are slow to pick up on open access, we have to appeal to them through the institutions who can influence their decisions. And the two institutions that can do the most on that front are funding agencies and universities. So we need more funder policies to favor open access. We need more university policies to favor open access. And there are hundreds of funding agencies and thousands of universities. So there's a lot of work still to be done. And there are millions of scholars. And somehow we have to get through to them. In the background, I haven't mentioned, the rate of growth for open access depends on the decisions of the authors. You can't provide open access to literature without the author's cooperation. And with author cooperation, you don't need anybody else's permission or cooperation. 
So we really have to get at them. But we can't get it. So the easiest way to get at them is through these institutions who have some influence over them. So on the one hand, we do need more author education, a lot more of it. But we also need uh, open access policies at funding agencies and universities. And then more uh, you know, personally, my uh, job description for five years has been to monitor everything that's going on, digest it, publish uh, monthly but sometimes daily analysis of what's going on, and offer concrete assistance and strategies to these institutions like universities, libraries, publishers, societies, and governments. But that job description is not sustainable. There's just too much happening in the open access world, and I can't do what I have been doing. I've got to start to cut back, or to put it another way, uh, I have to cut back further. I've been cutting back for two or three years, but the volume of open access development that I have to digest and stay on top of is just growing faster than one person can follow. So I'm going to have to you know, make some pretty serious changes in, the, in my job description. And right now I have funding from the Open Society Institute, the Wellcome Trust, and Spark. How can uh, the authors of Innovate support your efforts? That's a good question. You mean the readers of Innovate? Readers and authors. I'm assuming they're all scholars. They're all academics. And the first thing they can do is to provide open access to their own research as they finish it. They can submit it to an open access journal in their field if there are good ones. And sometimes there are. Sometimes there aren't. That's still growing. And if there are not good open access journals in their field, then at the very least they can deposit a copy of their peer-reviewed manuscript in an open access repository. Roughly 70% of subscription journals already permit this. They give blanket permission to their authors to do this. Many scholars fear that this violates copyright or it violates their copyright transfer agreement with the publisher. But for, again, 70% of uh, subscription journals, that's not true. The journals have already granted permission. Most scholars don't realize that. And they think they have to choose between publishing in a subscription journal and providing open access. But for 70% of the time, they don't have to choose between them, and they can have both. And secondly, they should work for open access policies at their university, at their learned society, and at any particular journals where they might have some influence, for example, as members of the editorial board. And they should correct misunderstandings about open access whenever they hear them. Peter, on that note, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us, and good luck on the challenges ahead.